Saddle River Range is the premier Texas indoor gun and archery range. They provide a family-friendly environment with shooting, retail shops, social and training environments designed to incorporate the best in safety, comfort, and technology. This is the best stuff the shooting industry has to offer, guys. Their world-class facility offers 24 indoor shooting positions for firearms with four climate-controlled indoor shooting bays consisting of 24 lanes with programmable target systems. For the archer and bow hunters out there, they offer two large archery bays that will accommodate 20 archers, including those sick 3D archery options. They've got a 33,000-square-foot facility housing a complete gun store with all your gun needs, ARs, pistols, rifles, shotguns, fancy stuff, ammo suppressors, all the stuff you want, full arsenal type things. Their training simulators, which are utilized by the law enforcement, public alike, offer lifelike training scenarios and simulated games. They also offer firearm and bow rentals, on-site gunsmithing, bow techs, a lounge area, instructional classes, events and party rooms, training classes, locker rentals, cafes with like the best club sandwiches you've ever had. They also offer the largest archery store in the entire Houston area. They offer several membership levels that fit any shooter's budget. There's never been a better time to join. I'm telling you, everything going on in the world, learn your gun stuff, people. Stop by Saddle River Range today and see for yourself or visit them at SaddleRiverRange.com. That's SaddleRiverRange.com. This is The Gage with host Chance Conradu. Are you freaking serious? It's Conrado. This is The Gage, and I am Chance Conrado. On this episode of the podcast, we have got Thomas Balch. Thomas Balch is a 25-year veteran of the Secret Service. This guy has protected four of the last five sitting presidents, George Bush Sr., Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, and then Obama. A great break from all the rodeo content we've been bringing. I mean, we did a lot of rodeo episodes last week, so it's it's time to... uh, listen to something that's not that but we just went through 9-11 he had a lot of insight about that i think if you're a patriot you listen to this episode check it out well thomas i do appreciate you kind of uh making the haul to, to dallas fort worth from from the woodlands there that's that's a nice place to be right now yeah yeah we love it there we really do uh we've been there about 11 years and you know with the secret service they transfer you a lot to, to test your loyalty and uh, when we got to the Woodlands, uh, my wife said, if we get transferred again, you're going alone. She found home. Uh, and <laughs> she loves it there. The kids love it there. So we're real happy. Well, and it's it's funny because pretty much everybody I talk to hates Houston. Yeah. But they love the Woodlands. Yeah. Yeah. So, who, I mean, whoever put that little suburb slash city together certainly did a good job. Yeah. There's a lot of good uh, areas that surround Houston. Um, I just, Houston proper is not the place to be harris county in general right uh i I just didn't even consider it when we're moving down here sure so montgomery county is the the place to be for us it's uh uh, rumored to be the most conservative county in all of texas and that's saying something and uh we love it certainly is i mean what's interesting about conservatism in in texas is they were just saying that texas could go blue yeah I'm, i'm hearing that rumor um but if you listen to carl rove uh, he always talks about, he's like a super strategist. He talks about follow the money. And if the Biden campaign is not putting any money in advertising in Texas, it means they don't even believe they have a shot. Right. So they're putting very little money into it to do ads. So it probably means they've already written it off. Sure. So let's sure. hope. Let's hope. They're, they're pumping a lot of money into swing states right now is they, what they're doing. So. They really are. So, which is interesting because... I, I mean, what state are they, I think, is it Wisconsin they're putting the most money into right now? Yeah, Wisconsin and Michigan and yep. Pennsylvania. So Fl- it's Florida the same, is the do or die. It's the same tactic that, that they always use. Yeah. Those are generally the states they put and, money And into. both of them. Both parties oh, have absolutely. to. absolutely. Uh, why put money into, you know, why would Biden put money into California? I mean, he's going to win that hands down. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, so you, you have to pick and choose your, your fights and where the money is best used to get more support. And, and they all do it. I mean, I, I was worried about Florida a few weeks ago because he was way down in the polls. And now he's running dead even. So we'll, we'll see what happens with Florida because as Florida goes, the, the election goes. Yeah. 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 I mean, uh, Trump did win Florida in 16. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, and it kind of seems like this election is shaping up to go very similarly just based on polling numbers way down in the polls. Now they're creeping up to be even pretty soon. I mean, w- without all the crazy economical stuff withstanding, it seems like it's going to be a very similar feel to what that was. I believe it. it is. It's already feeling that way. And, you know, the 
depending on where you get your media, when you, where you get your news from, they're all doing the same stuff they did in 2016, you know, and uh, let's hope the result's the same. Yeah, I mean, for it's going to be interesting, right? Because if Biden won the election, there would be there would be this immediate relief. I think the riots would stop. The coronavirus stuff would loosen up. It seems like that would be the case because if Trump wins, it's probably going to be hellacious yeah, for, it, for quite a while. And I'm warning anyone who'll listen that uh, the riots that are happening now uh, will pale in comparison to what's going to happen. They will lose their minds because they are going to accuse him of cheating. They're going to accuse him of rigging the election, Russian collusion. It's all coming back again. They're already setting the stage for that. Right. So if uh, if Trump does win... I think uh, the violence will really escalate. Sure. Now, let me ask you this, right? Because one of the terrifying things kind of about the Democratic Party right now is is the push for radical socialism, right? Yeah. Now, one of the things, like if you talk to political pundits or people who are really educated in politics, which I try to do as much as possible, um, it's hard to keep up with them sometimes, as you well know, but that with some of the friends you've got who are just lightning in a bottle when it comes to politics but uh if he wins and it'll be the same him being biden it'll be the same situation where you know the republican party gets the house and and what have you so we'll, it'll just be four more years of probably a stalemate like of usual, gridlock don't you think yeah. so yeah let, let's let's hope that the uh the down balloting goes well because if Whichever candidate can motivate their base, whether it's Biden or Trump, to get out and vote in droves, there's a good chance that they'll vote down Republican Party, straight ticket. Uh, and if that's the case, we might even win the House back. You, you never know. I think they have a good chance to win the House back. Uh, certainly don't want to lose the Senate and get, get the House. I, I would love to get all three, but uh, that might be a pipe dream right now. But, uh, boy, if they get all three— um, we could really get some good programs pushed through. Sure. You know, what's so interesting about you, and what I would say is probably the main reason I wanted to have you, is you've worked through four sitting presidents. Yeah. Which gives you an insight into the workings of our country and, and kind of the world that most people never have, right? If you work for the Secret Service, you're defending <laughs> presidents and doing what whatever it is behind closed doors that the Secret Service does, because what a lot of people don't realize is the Secret Service is not just you watch the president, right? There's a lot more to that job and different, I don't know if you'd call them branches of the Secret Service, but you worked in multiple places throughout yeah. your tenure in Secret Service. Yeah. Mo most people, when they hear Secret Service, they think, protecting the president. Uh, you know, many know we protect the vice president as well, but we also protect all the candidates. So uh, if they're running for president uh, or vice president, uh, they get Secret Service protection up to a certain point. Uh, there's a, a formula they have to figure out whether they're, uh, they've made it to a serious candidate status. We're not just going to give Secret Service protection to everyone. So they have to meet certain criteria before Secret Service is, is granted to them. But we also do a lot of investigations. People don't know that. Uh, we have field offices pretty much in, in every state uh, and overseas as well. And we do a lot of uh, uh, credit card fraud, all kinds of fraud, bank fraud. Uh, but we really were started in 1865 to combat counterfeiting, counterfeiting U.S. currency. Uh, and that's we still do that to this day. Uh, but uh, we're more well known for doing the protection side of the house. Right, right. It's so interesting because I mean the Secret Service is just it's big. It's a yeah. big outfit. Well, it it, it actually it, as far as other comparing it to other law enforcement agencies like the FBI, it's it's actually much small. Sure. Not much smaller than the FBI. Uh, the, the running joke when I was in, uh, it, it, Secret Service is larger now, but the running joke when I was in was there were more agents stationed in New York City for the FBI than Secret Service had in the world. Mm -hmm. So the FBI is, is a <clears throat> mammoth agency. Uh, but we've, we've grown. We've taken on more responsibilities over the years with the different fraud and different investigations and um, more former presidents because we still protect former presidents. Uh, so we, we've grown our staff, uh, support staff as well, not just special agents. So uh, we're doing a lot more, so we need a lot more personnel and, uh, and technology. They're very highly uh, reliant on technology nowadays, which you have to. Everything is technology, so you have to combat uh, the, the people wanting to do bad stuff with the technology. So that's how we find a lot of people and know they're, uh, who's serious about making threats and who may not be. 
Sure. Get a lot of threats. Yeah, well, let me ask you this, right? So, I mean, what was it that initially made you want to go into the Secret Service? I mean, it just it's a very unique job, and I would be curious to know what the mindset of someone coming through their youth and, you know, maybe your collegiate days. When was it that you are like, you know what, I think the Secret Service is, is what I want to do? I mean, I just wonder what the mindset is to push you, anybody in that direction. Yeah, I, I was in college at the time, and I was a uh, business management major, and uh, about sophomore year, I was like, you know, I, I like business. Uh, my father was a businessman, and I grew up outside of New York, which is the hub of business, I guess. Uh, and I just wasn't enjoying it as much as I would. But I loved my political justice classes. I loved my history classes, criminal justice I was taking. Uh, so I, I kind of did some soul searching and decided law enforcement. I probably would want to get into law enforcement. So I started applying to all different agencies. I applied to the FBI. I even applied to the CIA and and the Secret Service and a couple others. And uh, the Secret Service really took a liking. They started writing me back. And, you know, this is the days before computers, so everything. Is this this the 80s? This is the 80s, yeah. This is 87, 88. And uh, so they sent me all the applications. So I would get on a typewriter and I would type out all the applications and they want them in triplicate. So I send them back and then it would send me more and it just went back and forth. So about a year and a half later, I graduated college and uh, I got a call one day and said, you know, if you want a job with the Secret Service, show up on this day at this place. And I did. And 25 years later. Wow. It was great. So, so you were going through all that during kind of Reagan era. And- yes, Exactly. And, well, I mean, was President Reagan one of the people that inspired you to go to the Secret Service? Because I'm assuming, just based on what I know of you, is that you were probably a fan of Reagan. Yeah, yeah. I was a big Reagan support. And and think about the age now. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I'm, you know, in high school, uh, throughout my high school and even my younger years, eight years of his presidency. That was really the only president I knew. I mean, of course, I knew Jimmy Carter and, and all that. But I was so young, I didn't really know uh, any of Jimmy Carter's policies or what he put through or what he did, did do or didn't do. But I lived through Reagan and I was very, uh, very much a supporter of him, even at a young age. And the secret service angle was, was, was pretty cool. And, and I had some heroes in the secret service. I mean, we probably all know, have seen the video of, of Reagan's assassination attempt. So the man who threw the agent who threw Reagan in the car to get him out of there uh, was the special agent charge of the details. His name was Jerry Parr. And uh, I studied Jerry Parr. I studied how he conducted himself that day. And knowing what I know now, and even what I knew just when it, when it happened, uh, he saved his life. And I, at one point, I remember saying, wow, that would be an interesting job to have. I didn't take the path at that time. I'm glad my path did eventually get down there. But it made me really realize that hey, if I want to do something really cool and really good for my country and something I'm really going to enjoy, that that might be it. So it, uh, my path led that way, and that's the way I jumped on it and never looked back. Right. So Okay, so you go through this, what just seems a little, when you say it the way you said it about, like, hey, meet us here at this place, here's your typewriter, yeah. it's like a little shady, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm sure it's yeah. a lot different now. but yeah, It kind of was. It was very official. Um, you know, I kind of got letters you know, saying, okay, the next step is this. And I had to get a polygraph exam, a lie detector test, and you have to get a background investigation. You know, they went and talked to all my neighbors. They went to talk to my football coach and all my teachers. And they did a very thorough, because it's a top secret, top secret clearance you have to have. So it's sure. very thorough. Uh, so I was anticipating that I was going to get the call. And when I got the call, it was just very matter of fact, you know, yep. show up here at this time, bring this with you. We'll send you out a letter. Uh, formal offer. They sent out the letter with the formal offer. I accepted and and uh, went down there that day. Sure. So, what's the what was the onboarding process like? What was the training like? I mean, it's just obviously it's not going to be necessarily like a military branch, but I have to assume it'd be very similar to being onboarded as a police officer, maybe from a training standpoint. Yeah, it was um, at that time. It was about six months of training. So you'd, you'd go go down to the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center, uh, which is in Brunswick, Georgia, and there you learned. Uh, basic, um, investigative skills. Uh, 
and, and I say basic because it's across the line federal agents. So we had ATF agents in our class and we had uh, other agencies in our class, immigration at the time. So you all learn how to do an investigation. And then for the last three months, you come back to our training facility in Beltsville, Maryland. And that's where they teach you to specialize stuff that the Secret Service does, the protection and the counterfeiting and the fraud. So it's much more... Uh, much more fine-tuned for what the Secret Service does. So you'd spend about six months, and then your whole first year is pretty much OJT, on-the-job training, and you just learn as you go. They marry you up with, with senior agents, and you learn how to do the job from, from them. Right. So you went through this whole process, and then at that point, Reagan was out, and it was Bush Sr. Yes, sir. Who was the first sitting president you actually worked with. Yes. Yeah, so I started in what we call the uniform division at the White House, So my first assignment was at the White House. Uh, I did about three and a half years there uh, under the bushes. And uh, I was fortunate to uh, be selected to get on the emergency response team. Uh, so they're, it's like a SWAT team at the white house is how most people know it. So that was, uh, the, the, the exciting part of being at the white house. It wasn't just standing post and, you know, making sure nobody gets through this entrance, uh, it was, and it was during the first Gulf War, so there was a lot of action going on. People jumping the fence, people protesting. So uh, we we were pretty busy during that time, um, and I enjoyed it. Um, but then moving on to other, I, I was selected for a position as a special agent, and then went to the different field offices and worked my way up the ranks and to different places, and and I retired as a supervisory special agent in the Houston field office. Wow, interesting. Yeah, we yeah. kind of glazed over the other three presidents you worked for. Well, <laughs> I, I, I'll give you the whole timeline. Yeah. yeah. So uh, 41 is where I started. Uh, I got transferred to the Washington field office. Uh, then I got transferred to, to the New York field office. Uh, and then I went to the president's detail. I was selected for an assignment on the president's detail, and that was uh, Clinton's last two years and Bush's first three. Uh, so I was on uh, Bush's detail for 9-11, which is tomorrow, 19th anniversary tomorrow. Uh and then I went to our training division. I did five years there as a instructor. Uh, so I was teaching recruits uh, as well as people going to the president's detail. So if you're coming from one of the field offices, they give you a three-week training course on specifically for what's to be expected of you if you go to the president or vice president's detail to get you up to speed with how things operate. So I did that for about five years. And then they transferred me to Houston. Uh, and in between there, actually, I was on President Obama's um, his uh, during during the 2008 election. So uh, I did that for a full year, traveling with President Obama at that time, candidate Obama. Uh, that was eye opening. Uh, it certainly was. Uh, and then uh, got down to Houston and never looked back. Stayed in Houston the whole time. So retired in 2014 and uh, been uh, been retired happily for five years. Well, congratulations on your retirement. But I you. want to go way back to the '90s because <laughs> I'm so curious what it was what it was like when Bush Senior's only term was coming to an end for, and you know th- that Clinton era was so different from from Bush yeah. Senior. And and I mean, Bush Senior was not a well loved president. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, he wasn't in the beginning. He he was uh, after the Gulf War. Immediately after the Gulf War. Uh, I remember watching the news and saying his approval rating was higher than any president before him. Uh, but that quickly started to wear off. Uh, the economy started slipping a little bit. And I think the kiss of death with his his uh, his campaign for the 92 uh, election was the, you know, don't uh, read my lips, no new taxes. And then he raised taxes. I think that was the nail in the coffin. Uh, and I also think the country was changing just like it's changing now. And th- th- people were looking for younger leaders and Clinton fit that bill. I mean, he really appealed to the younger voters in this country and the, and the youth, uh, you know, when he went, went on MTV and played the saxophone and, uh, just, just people loved it. They ate it up and, um, uh, and he won, um, and took the, the country in a whole, whole different direction, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, people have a lot of stories about the Clintons. Um, I, I had no problem with, with President Clinton. I mean, he was a normal guy. I mean, you could talk to him, you know, and 
just he treated us very well. So sure. I have I have no problems. And some of the stuff gets overblown in the media, how bad they were. And um, I I can't even comment on that. I mean, Mrs. Clinton was a little tough, but I think things get get blown out of proportion a little too much. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Well, people get so tribal, right, with the political parties. Yeah. And, and what's interesting for somebody like you, right, is you are obligated to be completely neutral if you work with multiple presidents, right? Like, yeah. you, you don't have a choice. You have to protect. It doesn't matter what party they belong to. You're forced to protect them. Or you want to protect them. It's probably better saying force is, is probably not a nice word. but Yeah, it, it was a, a job. Right. And, and you were trained to do the job. You weren't trained to do the job for a political party. You right. Were, you were trained to do the job for the country. Right. And if something happened to any president, Democrat, Republican, independent, it would be catastrophic for the country. So uh, you have to you have to keep that in perspective every time you, you know, put your suit on and shine your shoes. Uh, we, we used to have a, a saying, which was, you know, you elect them, we protect them. Uh, just keep your politics out of it. Uh, did I agree with everything that I heard? President Clinton say? Absolutely not. When I was on the Obama detail, did I agree with what he was saying in his in his speeches? And uh, absolutely not. My politics couldn't be further from from what he was he was going to bring to the country. But it didn't matter. My job was my job. And I did it to the best of my ability. And the people under me, I made sure they did it to the best of their ability. And and uh, the, the world is a much safer place because of the people at the Secret Service, especially now. They're going through a lot of hell right now. I can't imagine. I mean, they're yeah. they're probably dealing with their highest threat levels maybe that they have protecting Trump right now. Yeah. I mean, I, I have to imagine that, that the threats that they are probably getting on a daily basis towards him or even themselves has is, is, is got to be escalated over what it has probably ever been, maybe since Reagan or before. Yeah, no, that, that's an absolute, I think. Um, you know, talking to some people that are still in, uh, you know, every day is a new day. And what's, what's the world going to bring? What are they going to bring? You know, we, we see what's happening in all the liberal cities and that are run by, you know, Democratic mayors or governors. And we have to realize that Washington, D.C. is as liberal as they come. So for the White House to be right in the middle of Washington, D.C., and the mayor is not doing probably what should be done to protect that area uh, is is really putting a big burden on the men and women of, of all law enforcement, but especially the Secret Service, to protect that 18 and a half acres that's known as the White House complex. Sure. And it's, it's really difficult. And uh, if... They truly are telling Metropolitan Police Department, Washington, D.C. Police Department, to stand down on certain things. That leaves them in a, a really bad disadvantage because now you got to pick up the slack, meaning Secret Service has to pick up the slack for what other police departments and agencies were doing. Uh, so I, I don't envy them at all. Uh, it's a real tough time to be any law enforcement, but to be uh, at the White House or on the, on the presence detail at this time is really difficult. Right. You know, it's interesting. I don't mean to kind of like flip over to a different topic, but you say that that the mayor is responsible for a lot of that. And this is one thing that people, and this is actually something a lot of the more uneducated people on the right are, are kind of at fault for, is they don't understand how our constitutional yeah. republic works. Yeah. Right? So they're, they're wanting Trump, and these are the folks on the right, to go in and just send the National Guard or, or or whomever to fix these metropolitan areas when he actually can't do that. That's not how our country works. And you being an educated man the way you are, working directly with those politicians in that environment, I, mean, I bet nobody understands the actual functions of our government better than you, at least in this room. Well, <laughs> uh, I, I know quite a bit and from being on the Secret Service as well as being a student of history. I love history. I minored in history in college and uh, I just love how our government is is set up, and it is checks and balances, and it is about the federal government is is designed to do certain things, and for them to do police work on the streets is not one of them. That is left up to state and local governments, and if they are not doing what they're supposed to be doing, the they can ask for help. They can ask if you're a, a mayor of a of a city, and you need help, you go to your governor. And the governor could help. The governor could send in state police or they could send in the National Guard, uh, which is under their discretion. And then if the governor needs help, they can come to the president and ask the president for help. 
and Prezen has limited things in his arsenal that he can do on, on that street level. But he certainly can assist. He could send federal agents out. He could send federal police officers out. And, of course, last resort, they could always use the military. But that would be, that would be a really bad situation if we sent our military in to police streets. So uh, it would have to be a complete collapse of the local and state governments before that happens. Sure. So when people say ignorant things like, you know, send the military in, that, that's, it'd be very difficult for that to even happen, to get to that level. It's, President Trump just can't wake up one morning and go, I'm going to send the National Guard into Minneapolis. Right. He can't do that. No. no. Uh, he, he can be asked to assist, and that's what he could do, but it has to come from the governor. It has to come from the mayors and the governors up to the federal government for him to act upon it. The other thing is, what people don't understand is, do you really want that to happen? Yes, it, 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 I turn on the TV and I see our cities burning and it, and it, and it, just, it, it hurts me to the core to see it because it's an American city. But our military is not designed to do that. Our military is designed to protect us from foreign threats, not to go in. And, okay, so they see somebody doing something or violence occurring. What if our military opened fire on these Civilians. protesters, yeah. yeah. Now we have the U.S. military killing U.S. citizens. That would be very ugly. The other thing is the people that you're talking about saying, oh, Trump should go in and take care of this. What happens if we get a Democratic president in there? And now there's the Democratic president, I don't know, think of a situation, wants to take away all our guns. And the very strong Second Amendment support says, you're not taking away our guns, and now they're protesting on the street. Uh, I don't think it would ever get as violent as, as what's happening now because most of the situations and the protests uh, that have happened that are, uh, that are conservative-based have always been peaceful. Uh, but say they, they start getting ugly in the streets. Do we want a Democratic president sending in troops to put down those protests? That, so you've got to reverse the roles. The, the military should be for military operations, not for putting down protests. Yep, absolutely. Even if they turn violent. The, that's the job of the mayor, the governors, and if it has to come up to the president and he could send law enforcement in there, okay. But we, we need to keep the military out of it. Right, and, and that's why I wanted to ask you that because you have such a, a deep knowledge and insight on those things that uh, I thought you'd be able to answer that question yeah. for people listening because the chances that uh, – People don't understand how our government works nowadays. It's getting higher and higher and higher well, on they, both sides. They, they don't teach civics or history really in schools anymore. And uh, it's really a shame because most of the, the youth, my kids are, are guilty of this. Most, most of the youth don't even know how our country was formed, created, why it was created the way it was. What is the forms of government? What are the three different branches? What they, they, they have no idea because they're not taught it's not important they don't believe i think it's very important why do you think that is that that they don't think it's important just an opinion oh uh, <laughs> uh rabbit hole um if we want to get into conspiracy stuff <laughs> i mean i'm not a conspiracy theorist in in general but there are certain things that i always question i always question everything i read i question everything i see i question everything on facebook or any social media and I try to get to the bottom of it. Uh, you know, it, it, it's if you want to believe some of the things about, you know, control the narrative, uh, control the minds. Um, you know, the, it, communism uh, back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, they always said they were going to take down the United States. But they knew they couldn't take it down through military. So they always said they were going to go in and infiltrate certain areas of our country and take it down from within. And There's one, a lot of books written on that topic. Huge amount of books. And one of the ways is our youth, indoctrinating our youth and slowly but surely weeding out our, our very proud history and inject all the bad stuff we've done. Uh, if you turn on any news thing and talk about these protests and watch the protests, that's what they're talking about. They're all talking about how bad the United States is, systematic racism, all these things, you know, that that there's some truth to a lot of it, but it's still the greatest place on the planet. This is the greatest country ever in the history of the world, not just 
right now. This is the greatest country ever created in the history of the world. And to find the flaws and only focus on the flaws is, is really uh, an injustice. But that's all they're teaching the kids now, how bad we are, not how great we are. Um, and, and it's really a shame. Well, it seems like it's getting dangerous because you've got highly educated people coming of age now and entering the political realm and perpetuating exactly that, you know, the AOCs of the world, yeah. if you will. And the the narrative that's being portrayed is it's just a terrifying thing because you, you can't find another place like the United States. Yeah. You know, you can't do what we're doing right right now in many, many countries. Yeah. And, and it's funny you say that because I would have always thought uh, – that it would be the ignorant people or the uneducated people that would be the problem in this country. But the problem in this country are the smart people, the intellectuals that don't want to think for themselves. They just turn on the TV or social media and they believe everything that is spoon fed to them. Think for yourself, do your own research. Don't believe everything you're told because you're being lied to. You're being lied to. And it, and it's happened for generations. I mean, this is not, not something new that the media is spinning things to what they want to see happen. They've been doing it for decades. And it continues, but it's gotten worse. And you used the word dangerous. It is getting dangerous because in the 24-hour news cycle, you can turn on and get any kind of news you want. And a lot of people get triggered by that and they get angry by that. And they believe the certain things, both sides. I mean, we, we were talking earlier about the extremes on the right and the extremes on the left. If everyone was sort of in the middle, we would probably have the civil society we used to have. Now you can't even talk politics with anyone anymore. You, you can't because if somebody is on the other side, they usually believe very strongly in their way. Very and, strongly. And, and they, they judge you if you're on the right and vice versa. Uh, everyone's judgmental and you can't have a differing opinion anymore. If, if you have a differing opinion, you're a complete nut or you're wacko. And, and that's not how this country was designed. It's supposed to have a way where I see things different thing, differently. You see things differently. Where, where can we find the common ground? Which is actually the whole purpose of the two party system is yeah. to try to find balance. Initially, that's why it was set up that way. Yeah. And it was a great system. Um, uh, in, in college, I remember taking a class of uh, um, U.S. presidency, and they went over all the presidents and what they did great and what they did bad. And, and it started out, obviously, how our system was created in the two, two-party two system. And the, the professor was very adamant that the two-party system is the best system that we could have. And I agreed with him at the time. I I'm starting to wonder if it is the best system. Not, not that I think there is a better system out there, but I'm questioning, w could there be a better system? Could sure. there be a, another way to do it? Uh, because it, it seems that we've, we've grown away from this two-party system where we have differing opinions, but we are still civil to each other. If, if we're at the point where we have differing opinions and I'm taking my toys and go home and I'm not going to even talk to you. I mean, that's where we're at. I mean, look what's happened with the negotiation for the, the stimulus that they want to put out. Nancy Pelosi saying my way or the highway. She's saying you need to come to me to negotiate this. And, you know, Trump is not a person you threaten. If you threaten him, he's going to, he's not going to do it. So, and who suffers? The people suffer. Yep. So we have to have people that will work together. So if the two party system has worked for 240 years that that's great if there's a better system that we can implement uh, you know isn't it funny though that the only system they're trying to push is the one system that's never worked anywhere never worked anywhere every socialist communist country has failed and and quickly quickly these i mean our 240 year uh, experiment that they call the united states um uh, and the constitution and everything that 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 we live by uh, has been modified. It has been tweaked. We've learned from our mistakes. We've hopefully fixed them. We move on and we try to make ourselves a more perfect union. Uh, socialism, communism, I mean, never lasted, never did. Uh, you know, it's all about incentive. I mean, if, if I'm going to work my butt off and you're going to take all my stuff and give it to people who don't work, how hard am I going to work? If, if I get the fruits of my labor, I may work really hard. And if the fruits of my labor help 
these other people. Well, that's what it's about. But you can't, you know, you can't take from one to give to another. Just never has worked, never will work. No, never. And it's it's funny because the, the more modern version of socialism comes from a book that was a hypothesis. Yeah. Right. So I just doesn't really make sense why people are actively calling themselves Marxists at this point and, yeah. and, and trying to do that. It's just something I personally can't wrap my head around. No, but. no. And, and, you know, they've, they've taken that book and they've had different leaders that have embraced it and moved on and, and tried to work it a different way. But I mean, think about socialism and communism that, that I knew from growing up, you know, the Soviet Union was still around for most of my youth and through high school. Uh, and, you know, I, I was taught what it was in school. And I, as a student of history, I learned on my own what, what it was about. Uh, so to have people pushing that now when the track record was violence and chaos and innocent people being killed because you think differently than, than the party, uh, and, and people still want to experiment with that I, I i just don't get it i mean isn't you know that what to... happens though historically because there's a reason that right why it keeps coming back it's because the people who experienced it their generation dies off mm -hmm. we've got a handful of people left who were experienced in world war ii they're gone so there's been nobody in living history who's experienced the direct results of said i call it the political party call it what you want yeah. it, you know said politics and, and the repercussions of that. How many Jews were killed? <laughs> yeah. You know, how, how many? Nine and a half million. Nine and a half million Jews were killed. There's very few of them left. Yeah. So there's nobody living in to our society them. today to remind them of the dangers of yeah. that. Well, and that goes directly back to your point of why isn't this stuff taught? Because even if those people aren't on the earth anymore, it's, it's written. It's in history books. Now everyone will look back on the history books that they're not taught to read anymore in school and they'll even doubt it and you have the people who don't even believe the holocaust happened i mean because they're so far getting conspiracy theorists they're so far into the conspiracy theorists that everything didn't occur and that's just the the west saying that that was the reason all the stuff happened and uh people take things too far on, on both sides and right and we really got to get back to the center and, and I don't see how we're going to do that. Uh, you know, a lot of people say that, that Trump is the one that is, is uh, fanning the flames of all this division. Uh, I, I think he's the only one standing in between us and full-blown socialism. And if he doesn't get reelected, this country is going to change immediately. And they, they already have an agenda set and, a lot of their supporters have already bought up, bought up, bought in on it. So I don't know how we've gotten to the point just in 10 years ago that if somebody was labeled a socialist, it was a really bad thing. So the Democrats really avoided that. Now they're openly calling themselves socialists. And in they're some, in, in some office. Yes. Yep. Making decisions for you and me and. Guys, don't forget to check out Saddle River Range. Don't forget their sick gun store with all the AR rifle pistol options we talked about. They also have this thing called Club Crockett memberships. You have access to your own private membership lounge, which features a private rear entrance and parking, private shooting range, viewing area, fine furnishings, fireplace, multiple flat screen TVs, wireless internet, mini kitchens, cigar bar rooms, private bathrooms, and more. Don't forget to check them out. SaddleRiverRange.com. The terrifying thing is, is, is no great countries ever lasted. No. They always have fallen. Mm -hmm. This is supposed to be the one that doesn't. But you've got people, in, in particularly in my age group and, and, and below, who want that so badly. And, yeah. and you could say anything you want to them. They're going to find a way to argue it. They're going to say that's not the case. Yeah. They'll say that Joe Biden, which is funny because some of the policies that Joe Biden pushed in his Half a, <laughs> half a century as a politician yeah. were so far the opposite of what he says now. I mean, the fact that they call Trump a racist and not Joe Biden a racist is yeah. one of the craziest things I've ever heard. Uh, it, you are spot on. It, it's, it's unbelievable. And how quickly 
candidate Biden had changed everything he's done for 48 years because their party has been hijacked with the extreme left. And I don't know if he's being fed this or, or that the only way you're going to get elected is if you come and do this hardcore socialist stuff. And he bought onto it. I mean, here's a guy who was a devout Catholic and didn't believe in abortion up until, what, a year ago? Now he's all, he's all about abortion. The, the one thing that the youth always claims and why they view socialism um, positively is the, the word that comes up all the time is fairness. It's about being fair. You know, these people who are CEOs of these companies uh, are taking our money that we spend and they live very in, in plush places. Who's the richest man in the world right now? Uh, Bezos. Jeff Bezos. What yeah. party is he backing and system is he backing? Yeah. Doesn't make any sense. Yeah, yeah, uh, and and that's what it is. So the fairness thing just it just doesn't hold water. So and do you think Bezos just woke up the richest man? No, the, the guy. I don't know what his work ethic is. I never read books on on Bezos, but I, I'll I'll tell you. I guarantee he worked his ass off to to create what he has. I remember when Amazon came out, uh, and you know it was a bookseller, and you're like, wow, online books that that's pretty cool. Think of what he grew that to. Think about how much work he he had to put in to do. Think about how many people he employed, how many families he feeds because he created this empire. Uh, but because he has money, he's a bad guy. Any business owner, they're they're bad guys because they they did well, they made money. I, I mean, I employ fifty people. Um, you know, I, it, if I didn't exist and I didn't take the chances I took and try to build a business. Those 50 people hopefully would have jobs elsewhere, but that's 50 less jobs out there for people. Um, you know, it, the fairness is is about, a, it should be about a system of creating something out of your own hard work and your own risk-taking, and hopefully, and to use the, the reagan S trickle down, hopefully it trickles down where you can hire people, feed their families, they can work their ways up, maybe they go and start their own business, maybe they can become and very the cycle successful, continues. and the cycle continues. I, I, that's fairness to me. Uh, everyone has equal opportunity in this country. You, you, you don't have, uh, you know, you're not, you shouldn't be given everything, but you should have equal opportunity to achieve something. Shots fired. Sounds like it. Hopefully downstairs, not in here. Yeah. What are you What are you carrying right now, Tom? <laughs> <Yeah>. We're covered. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's just interesting, right? And I think it's an endless topic, right? It's an endless conversation, and there's probably far more intelligent people you could have this discussion with than myself. I mean, for God's sakes, you're good friends with Dan Bongino, and I don't know anybody who probably articulates as well as that guy does in an aggressive manner, and it works. Yeah, but uh, he's spot on. He, he truly is for what yeah. he represents and what he believes. I mean, you see it in the guy's eyes that he's exactly speaking what he's, he finds to be truth. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, it, it's it's interesting, right? Because what you're, what you're finding is there's a lot more people – now, because that's always kind of been my issue with the right, is that they are, will stay quiet, right? So that's that's one thing that I actually admire about the left. Even if I don't agree with the thing they say, it's like they're going to come out and they're going to say it. Yeah. They're going to march the streets and they're going to say it. They may have no clue what they're saying, but they're going to go out there and they're going to tell it to you. Yeah. The sky is purple, the sky is purple, and you're going to hear that the sky is purple until the end of time. Yeah, yeah, they uh, – and and – the other thing they're very good at is they're, they're not going for the home run. They're, that for, you know, half a century now, even longer, they've been going for take a little bit at a time, take a little bit of your liberties away, take a little bit here, a little bit there, and before you know it, you're on the socialist train. Uh, you know, they didn't want, you know, in the 50s when all this stuff started happening, it wasn't, okay, let's try to make the United States a socialist or communist country now. It was all about the future. How can we do this? Well, let's implement this and let's implement that. And, and before you know it, you, you turn around and you, even if we're not socialist as a country yet, we have a lot of socialist programs out there. Uh, a lot of it is, you know, taking from one and giving to the other. That is pretty close to socialism. Which people like myself who are paying into Social Security on a, on a biweekly basis. Yeah. Yeah, that's one it, of those things. It, it is. Um, you know, and it's 
it's the entitlement stuff. Everyone thinks they're entitled to have all that. Uh, you know, I, I, I am certainly one that believes that if, if people are down on their luck, uh, you lost a job, the economy's not good, whatever the case is, we should help those people. But it shouldn't be permanent. It shouldn't be, you know, third generation welfare that my grandfather was on welfare and my father was on welfare, so I'm going to go on welfare. Uh, there's people that haven't worked a day in their life and somebody has to pay for their lifestyle. Uh, and that's the working people. The working man and woman are paying for that lifestyle for somebody to not work. Uh, that eats me up. I mean, I, I don't I don't mind paying taxes. Uh, I don't I don't mind helping people. Uh, a buddy of mine is is going out to uh, Louisiana. He loaded up his uh, thir- third time now, lo- loaded up a trailer with everything you can imagine, gas and toilet paper, and, and he's bringing it out to the people out there that are still suffering two-plus weeks after the hurricane. And I don't mind giving money for that. I don't mind, you know, Venmoing him money so he can go to the store and buy stuff for these people. They're hurting. Sure. Uh, but for people who uh, just... They know no other way. They've never worked a job, and they just know to collect from the government. That, that's not what, how this system was created. It's it's meant for everyone to have the opportunity and do great for themselves. So, so it's interesting, right? Because you've probably been privy to some very high-level conversation in regards to topics just like this and have been now for a quarter of a century, essentially, um, or were until you retired, why has there not been any solutions to this put forth with either party, right? Like yeah. why, why, why it, well, I mean, it's gotta be because of the way our, our political system runs through, you know, through the house and the Senate and what have you. And, and it just always ends in a stalemate. I'm assuming that's the reason, but yeah. yeah. And I would say stalemate is a very apropos word uh, because everything now seems to be that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, people don't fight for their principles anymore. Um, I, I, I do agree, and we talked about it a little earlier, about uh, compromise. I mean, a lot of times you do have to compromise. Uh, you know, Kevin Brady is our representative for the Woodlands, um, and he arguably could be the second most powerful person in the House of Representatives. He he runs the money. He is the person who, di- who directs it when, uh, you know, uh, when the Republicans p- get back in there. So he's, he's very powerful, and... Uh, he had a challenger this past uh, this past election cycle, and I listened to his challenger, and uh, there was nothing that I disagreed with his w- with what he was saying. He was a true conservative between gun rights and and working and and how our country should be and uh, spending. I mean, spending, spending, spending. We have to control spending, and uh, you know, Kevin Brady. If you look at his record. He, he isn't that conservative. But I also know that a person in his position, very powerful position, he had to negotiate. For him to get President Trump's tax bill passed, he had to cross the aisle and say, hey, how can we make this work? How can we compromise? This is very big. This is going to help out all Americans. I'd, I would like your vote on this. I'm sure he had to compromise and and do things that probably did not uh, really sit well with his constituents. Uh, to be very honest, uh, a lot of his spending plans and what he's voted for, I'm completely against. But he probably had to do some of those, uh, cast some of those votes to get the big stuff through. So uh, compromise is always good, and I, I hope Congress can can uh, get there at one point, uh, especially when they in, include the executive branch in that. But it, it's it's really a bad state of affairs right now. Yeah, I mean, for you, I mean, being as educated as you are, I've said that a lot, but, I mean, do you think there's any hope for the country? I think there is, but uh, I, I, I really have strong feelings, very dark feeling that, uh, if if President Trump is reelected, I think the violence will be astronomical. They they the, the left will lose their minds. What we're seeing now on the streets is violence that we're seeing on the streets. I think is is a kiddie game compared to what they 
probably already have planned and what they have in store. Uh, again, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I do believe that there are people funding this. They are very well organized, and they're going to pull out no stops to let every area of this country know that they believe the election was stolen and Russian collusion and all the other things, that he's not a legitimate president, that really Biden won and you know, because he defunded the post office or whatever rumors, stories they're going to bring up that he impeded uh, the election. And that is the reason that we don't have a President Biden. They're going to lose their minds. It, 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 it really scares me. It does. I honestly, I I think that could also be the same it said for the same for the right, that if Trump isn't reelected, that base is just going to say similar things where the left stole it. It's I just say that it's two sides to the same. It's the same side to to the same coin. I I think if Biden is elected, uh, and and look if if there's fraud, voter fraud on either side of the aisle that can be proven, uh, we got we got to correct it and redo it because that can't be tolerated. Elections can't be stolen. But I do believe that if the only way this violence is going is not going to happen is if Biden gets elected. If Biden wins and there is no sign that. Uh, there was some shady business. There will be zero violence. I don't. I don't. I don't see the right coming out and starting to firebomb buildings uh, because they fairly lost an election. Don't say it. That'll never happen. No, it's never happened. Never, never. I mean, remember all the Tea Party stuff? Just what eight, nine, ten years ago? I guess yeah. it was that. Every mainstream media, oh, they're having a rally, these Tea Party people, the far right, they're going to cause all this, uh, this bad stuff, and there's going to be violence, and they expected violence, and, and there was really never any violence that I ever saw reported. It really let them down, there wasn't violence, to the point that they actually, at these rallies, would go and clean up all the trash and leave the park better than when they found it. Uh, I don't see that on the other side. I mean, it, they, they're destroying things, not cleaning up their mess afterwards. They're, they're trying to destroy things. These cities are, some of them are, are destroyed. A- absolutely. And, and there's just, there's, there's not really anything you can compare to it on the right side. I mean, I guess if the Tea Party thing's the best, the best example of that. And you know what's funny about Ty is Ty disagrees with literally everything we're saying. <laughs> and he's dying over there not to just hijack the podcast. I see so, it, but it's... So you say that there's no comparison to the right. There are so many different groups on the right side that are that can be seen as extremist. White supremacist is a big issue, and I kind of want to see what I want your I want your opinion on at least with the white supremacist groups, and especially the I want to say the Q, QAnon groups too, which is just really far right conspiracy theory type thing, type groups that are just on the the on the opposite side of what the far left is. So there are far extreme groups on both sides. Yes, There's far of course. Right. And I, I would think that they're very similar, meaning they're, they are so anti the other side that they could tend to be violent. On this side, they're so anti the other side that they could be... I look at them as criminals. I don't look at them as part of the right, and I don't look at them as part of the left. The one thing I have noticed is when you're completely the... On the, on the far side of the left spectrum, and you do commit all this violence, it is either accepted or not spoken from the moderates. On the Republican side or the conservative side, when you have, you brought up white supremacy and some of the other groups, they are persona non grata with the moderate conservatives. They don't want them in their party. They don't want to be associated. They don't want them associated with the conservative wing. But the liberal people almost embrace the people who are far, far left. And and if, if you look at how the Democratic Party has evolved, if you will, uh, over the past 10, 15, 20 years, there are, it doesn't appear there are any moderates left. Joe Biden you know, in, in the history that I have with him and knowing his voting record and what he said in Congress, was a fairly moderate Democrat. 
now he has bought into the, everything, all their plans. He he is on board because somebody got to him and said, if you don't believe this, if you don't state this, you're not going to get elected because the Democratic Party believes that. You're not going to be able to get those votes. Um, don't you wonder this, though? Like, the reason they went for Joe Biden is because they're hoping to capture the moderates, right? Because they had a host of other extremist candidates they could have went with. But they went with Joe Biden, who at one point said he didn't want to be president or or try for what was this the fourth time or the third time? Uh, I think third, it's right? the third, yeah. Yeah, it's the third time he's run two failed campaigns already. He is so old and comatose that he he says things like, if you don't vote for me, he ain't black and doesn't even remember yeah. he said it. Yeah. So you can't tell me that that man wants to spend the next four or eight years of his already shortened life actually doing this. Yeah. So he was systematically chosen to try to capture moderates is my thought, because they know if they went with anybody else, there'd be no way to win. I yeah. mean, they're not going to win with Bernie Sanders. Right. And I think that the most fearful thing I have, if, if this was Biden of even just three or four years ago and he was elected based on what he did, I, I could probably live with that. I mean, I lived through eight years of Obama. I could probably live with four years of, of, of Biden. Who Biden truly probably is yeah, or he, was. Yeah, yeah, he was pretty middle of the road. And I, di I disagree that you think that he's far left. He, he said multiple things where he's still moderate. And then even even socialists have said that we wish Biden was far, was more socialist because he isn't. He is He runs more moderate than you than people perceive – that people on that conservatives perceive that he is going far left. He is much more moderate than just the conservative notion that people are saying that is because he's not going far left. There's even been things where say, people have said, including Trump, saying that, oh, he wants to defund the police. Biden has said the exact opposite on that. There, He still has very moderate viewpoints. He's not falling far left that people... As far left as people say that he is. Okay, we're not going to turn this into a campaign rally for Joe <laughs> I'm Biden. Not saying, I'm not saying that, but I'm going to... I am going to say that there are things that are being misperceived, at least on that end. Okay, so uh, the thing I know a lot about is the Second Amendment. Joe Biden was never, uh, I think he was uh, definitely on the left side of moderate when it came to guns. Remember that, just take your shotgun and do some blasts out your window. That's what I tell Jill if, if somebody's breaking into the house, okay? So good to know he owns a shotgun. But he quickly, in the last two years, has gone to, you damn right we're taking your guns, and Beto is going to be the one that does it. So just the Second Amendment alone shows me that he has been influenced by the far-left people to change his position on stuff. We also talked about abortion. Uh, I'm a Catholic. Uh, I have my opinions on abortion. He did as well. He completely changed that because he was told by his handlers you ain't getting elected if, if you don't believe in choice. So he's changing. I'm, it, now, it could be all rhetoric. It could be, again, his handlers are telling him stuff. Hey, Joe, we know how you feel, but don't say it anymore. Say it this way. Hey, Joe, you know, the polling says that if you say we're going to take your damn guns, then say it. So, you know, they go how the wind goes. I mean, the, the DNC didn't even mention the violence until the polling showed that Hey, guess what? This is this is creeping up and biting us in the butt. Uh, we have to address. We can't just put the blinders on like there's no violence going on in these major cities that they firebombed all these buildings. So we have to address it, and now they address it. So the polling says we have to take this position. So they take the position. And look, this is politics. This ain't just Democrat Republican. Both both parties do it. They look at the polls. What are the people interested in? What are the most, what are the things we have going for us? What are the things we have, they have going for them? Let's hammer them on those issues and let's, let's talk about the things that are good for us. That's politics. I yeah. lived it too long. Yeah. And the problem is your, your run of the mill American gets too wrapped up in those politics. Don't actually understand what's going on behind closed doors. But I think that may be a decent place to stop with the political talk. Um, I, I just, have some other questions I'd like to sure. get into and I don't want to continue to, to do the Biden versus Trump thing too much because it just gets, it gets too tribal. Everyone but, uh, get, and, and it's, everyone gets passionate about it. They, they do. do. It's hard not to, right? Yeah. Cause you see it directly affecting whatever it is your beliefs are. If you're a younger person like Ty or even myself, you get really hung up in, in what you think the key issues are in this country because you may not understand what the actual ones are. Yeah. And, uh, I am by no means, 
at a level politically where I should be spending an entire podcast debating the finer points of of Biden's 50 year political career. Yeah. Uh, like you are, because you are much far more intelligent on that. But, uh, the one thing that I really wanted to, wanted to talk about before we wrapped up was your experience with the nine 11 thing, because we kind of got into that a little bit and it was just like, it's, I've been waiting to reintroduce that topic because I can't imagine a more contentious time to be in the secret service or any branch of the military. I mean, the passions and the fear and, and the way that the country rallied together around nine 11 was so inherently different than the division we're seeing now that uh, I would just kind of like to hear about that. Yeah. So, um, boy, if we could go back to, um, a country on, uh, nine, 12, Oh one, uh, country that stood together, that realized we were in it together. Uh, you know, it was a horrible thing that happened on nine 11, but the, the good of this country came out on nine 12 and, uh, you know, uh, the rallying cry uh, after that was never forget, never forget, never forget. And unfortunately, we forgot much more quickly than I thought we'd ever forget. Uh, here we are, 19, almost 19, uh, 19 years away from it. Uh, it. It was a tough time. And to be on the president's detail, uh, I, I would like to say things changed a lot. But when you know, we protect the president with everything we got. I mean, we have other protectees that are lower level protectees, as we call them, that don't quite get the assets uh, that the president gets. I mean, uh, you know, when I was on for the first 10 years or so, Lady Bird Johnson was still alive. I mean, she was being pushed around in a wheelchair. If we brought her somewhere, nobody would even know who Lady Bird Johnson was. Uh, so we certainly didn't put counter assault teams and counter sniper teams on her because the threat level wasn't there. But the president, anywhere he goes, no matter what president it was, gets the highest level of um, assets that the Secret Service can throw at it. So it's not like we, okay, well, we need to start doing this now. But we certainly f were more cognizant of that the world has changed. The world definitely changed on that day. And we really had to take some other things into consideration. Uh, and we did. Uh, you know, people didn't weren't allowed to get as close to the president anymore. Um, anybody within arm's reach of the president had special screening and had to be, um, had to be vetted a little closer. Uh, but we always did that anyway, but we just took it to another extent. Uh, so yeah, nine, nine 11 was a, a real game changer in the secret service and, and, uh, and for the country and the world. I mean, it was a horrible thing. Um, uh, and we were attacked and, and uh, we had to make some changes to it. So ironically, even though I was on the president's detail uh, on 9-11, uh, I was tempted out to uh, one of his daughter's detail. Jenna Bush was going to the University of Texas at the time. So I was actually in Texas at the University of Texas in, in um, Austin on her detail when it all happened. And yeah, I, it, a lot of personal stuff. I'm uh, originally from New Jersey. I did seven years in the New York field office, was in the World Trade Center, was in seven World Trade, which was the third building to collapse. Um, there's a lot of conspiracy about that building collapsing as well. But uh, so I had some personal things. My brother was in five World Trade Center when it went off. I had a lot of friends that were downtown that worked in that area. So it, it affected me. Lost a couple friends. We lost a couple people in the Secret Service that happened to be there. Uh, so it, it was a harrowing day. And um, and and again, not to get back into the modern politics and where we are now, but I could have never thought that this country could, could be at the position we are now when the pride and the, uh, we're all Americans feeling that, that came about right after 9-11. It's deteriorated so rapidly that, uh, it's like two different countries now. Uh, but yeah, and tomorrow we'll all remember, hopefully, and uh, everyone will remember the, all the people that uh, that perished that day. It was horrible. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's interesting that you come in the kind of the eve of 9-11. It worked out really well from that standpoint. But uh, I mean, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. I feel so much smarter now, thanks to you. Uh, yeah, I don't know that. but Well, it's not. It's my brain. I know it's smarter than it was before you got here because <laughs> I know what it was before. <laughs> but uh you know, it's, it's exciting, and, and, and you've got Saddle River Range there, and that's a, a – God, that's a nice place, and you Thank do some you. really yeah. cool things. And it's just really 
a kind of an honor to, to spend time with people who have the, the experience you have, what you've got, and, and you've served our country for so long. And, yeah. and I truly thank you for that. And uh, you come at virtually everything from a very open-minded position. You know, that's the one problem we find is some people refuse to educate themselves on both sides of the fences because they're so tribal and stuck in one one mindset. And the first thing you told me is, hey, I watch both. I have to. You know, I won't make a decision based on one person's thing. And, and I think that's probably the underlying message here is educate yourself. Yeah. You know, don't let yourself be indoctrinated, even left or right. It doesn't matter. And, and I'll tell you, it, it's the most frustrating thing. I mean, I have family members, I have friends that, that uh, are liberal and I don't, I don't care that they, they view things that way. What I do care about is they view things that way because that's what they were told. And if they would just do a, a minuscule amount of, of research, they would realize that it was either false, what they were told, or, or extremely exaggerated uh, or taken out of context. So uh, you got you to gotta be a free thinker, and, but you have to trust but verify all your information because if only the argument you have against uh, conservative values or, or my principles, say, are just parroting what the other side says or what you heard on CNN through Cuomo or any of the then then that's not a good argument. Your, your argument should be based on facts, not what somebody told you. Uh, so that's the only frustration I have in it. I'm, I'm more than willing to hear other people's opinion. But don't tell me uh, Cuomo's opinion because that's all you're doing. You're, you're telling me what Cuomo told you, and you're just repeating it. So let's, uh, let's research a little more, and then we'll have that discussion. That's how I view things. I think that's probably the most sensible way to do it. Yeah. For, for anybody on either side or anywhere in the middle, you know, we've lost our sense of, of conversing with people. Yeah. And and that's probably a lot to do with why we're where we are right now. Yeah. Chance, this is a great podcast. I watch quite a few of them. So appreciate good that. Good luck with more of them. And, Thank you. And keep it going. And thanks for coming. I, I do I do appreciate it. Absolutely. So. Thank you. All right. Perfect. All right. This has been The Gage, hosted by me, Chance Conrado, produced and edited by our guy Ty Yeager. Shout out to the executive producers, Dustin Pointer and Cody Denton. Marketing and content by Cassie Emerson. Our theme song is by Shay Ashire and the Night Howlers. Make sure to rate and review this podcast, as well as follow The Gage on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And make sure to subscribe to The Gage wherever you get your podcast. We'll see you guys next time.